Today, we're going to break down and dissect the behavior of David Callaghan. Craig, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Well, let, let's take it a step further. He's not just suspected. He is convicted of murder. David Callaghan ah. was sentenced to life in prison with parole eligibility after 18 years for killing his 53-year-old girlfriend and burying her body behind the couple's home in an Akron's Middlebury neighborhood. Callahan pleaded guilty in March to felony charges of murder, tampering with evidence, gross abuse of a corpse, and first-degree misdemeanor of domestic violence. Guys, if you haven't been to 8MC Interrogations, which is a YouTube channel, that's where this video comes from. If you're a true crime fan, it's the place for you to go hit. This guy has shared footage with us. The footage is from police interrogations and body cam. He cleans it up, makes it sound, and the video worked well and builds a story out of it. Worth going to check. Yeah, and because I follow that guy, I have for a while. They kept sending you videos. Dude. That's that's we're following. I'm on that, and the thing he'll take all that stuff and make the story out of it, like you were just saying. So it's really yeah, it's beautiful. It's really, he does it so well. He does it so well. How you doing? Is Martha here? No, uh, she's probably at her boyfriend's house. What's your name, bud? David. David. Callahan. David Callahan. All right, come on down here for me. Just have a seat, if you would. Why do you think she's at her boyfriend's house? Oh, that's where she stays most of the time. Where's that at? I don't know. I don't even know who it is, but really. I mean, are she's... you the only one here? I mean, the dog, yeah. You and the dog? I mean, she's here maybe a couple times a week anymore. I mean, we've Probably. actually been split up for a year. We've been in separate bedrooms for the last year. You know what I mean? She's... Let me get your social real quick. She's schizophrenic. She's been off her medication, on and off her medication, I don't know how many times. You know what I mean? Everything's top secret. Her, uh, I guess her and her daughter's fighting again. 604 to computer. So. Well, that's part of the reason we're out here, because no one in her family's talked to her since July. I don't know how. I know, I know she's texted her. No, she hasn't. Several times. She has another phone besides that. Well, who are you getting texts from? Huh? Who are you getting texts from? I'm her. She had, no, she hasn't. I mean, I see her very randomly here. You know, the, the house is in her name. We got the house eight years ago. Right. I mean, I'm making arrangements to move off slow for sure. I just, I just don't have the money. You know right. I mean, uh, I'm trying to. Like I said, I, I know she's seen somebody else. I, I've dated What's him. his name? I don't even know. I've never met him. Where does he live at? I don't know. I have no idea. What, does he live in Akron? I would think so. You would think so. But you don't know. No, I don't. Is I she don't in know. Ohio? Yeah, as far as I know, yes. When's the last time you talked to her? I don't know. Probably, say, five, six days ago, maybe. Where was that at? I was here. She see, stopped I see, to see her passing. I was leaving. She All right, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, you'll notice his throat protection right away, which is a big deal. I'll let one of you guys take that and explain that, uh, maybe unpack it for everybody. But his immediate reaction is to begin laying out details and information that suggests his lack of involvement in anything that might have happened. That's his instant reaction. Nothing else, which is a big deal. So in your life, and I want you to write this one down if you're watching, keep it on your fridge. Pay close attention to whenever detailed information is being presented to me, write that down, I didn't ask for. So in essence, pay attention to these moments. We call these detail spikes. And when you hear them expressed like this, you're hearing something very significant. The behavior is locked down. He's only using his fingers to gesture. Uh, I call these finger shrugs. There's lots of single shoulder shrugs in there, which indicate a, a lack of confidence in what somebody's saying. So far, none of these behaviors are timed with any specific words or phrases, like Scott likes to say all the time. There's facial touching. There's artery protection, which we do in response to fear unconsciously. This pulling the wrists in toward the body like this. There's joint protection, which Mark is probably about to talk about. I'm not sure. Uh, there's also a lot of what I call post-movement adjustments. 
So this indicates like after a person's moving, then they make another adjustment again. This is indicative of uh, indicative of a severe increase in somebody's stress level, but it's also an increase in the desire to manage perception. So if you've subscribed for even a week or two, you're probably able to spot a lot of those already. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, can't agree more. Uh, so yes, protection here of uh, the windpipe here and carotid arteries here, both very, very vulnerable. And the other hand across the chest as well. I think probably right into the armpit here. Again, protecting this vulnerable area here. Now, he has come out in a bit of a vulnerable state. There he is in his dressing gown, bare feet as well, very vulnerable. So, and the police have turned up to his to his home. So there could be some very rational reason why he's going to be a little more protective, given that this might be a surprise for him. He he's maybe be there's a sense of intrusion potentially, and he's not dressed particularly well, especially uh the feet there. But yeah, protection of the wrists there again, vulnerable areas and the groin when he sits down. But for me, the most important thing about this is that he does sit down because his edges. He edges towards there and the officer says, take a seat. And he sits down immediately in a very vulnerable position. This would suggest to me that he is very compliant. He takes a subdominant position there. Obviously, the officer at this point has height dominance. He's allowing himself into a subdominant position. He's very quickly compliant to that. That's really important because I think that's going to play out in the later videos that we see and might be an indicator, indicative, uh, as you might say, as to how the uh, interviewers get the results that they get from him. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, a couple of things that we could talk about, but you just said something very powerful. I think what we're seeing is the animal, the organism doing what made the organism successful. He has experience with law enforcement, a lot of it, we find out throughout the interview, but it shows because he's compliant for a reason. He knows better than to do something stupid. But he comes with a with a plan. I'm just going to stick to one little part of this whole interaction. He came with a plan for what he's going to say. He came with a cover story. Cover stories I love because they're always garbage and they always fall apart. He's reciting an answer he wanted to give, including throwing out a phone number. And he's so occupied that he's looking dead at the guy when he asks the question, the second officer. And he doesn't really hear the question because he's so occupied delivering his message. And he goes, huh? And does that single shoulder shrug you guys were talking about? He doesn't answer and he starts down the path of chaffing to redirect. When we say chaffing and redirect, that's something I've always used that says a plane drops chaff so that a missile will follow it. When the missile follows, it takes off and leaves it. Simplest way to understand it. So people use words in that way. And if people are smart, they often get away with it because they're subtle in their execution. When they're dumb, it looks like this. So you see his chaff is really dumb and he gets right back to a source lead. He mentions a boyfriend. What's his name? Boom, now you got a source lead. And a source lead is anything a person says that's hot. When we're interrogating in a Sharfian interrogation, we may not even know who we're talking to. We're probing, we're poking, we're going after information, and that source lead will get us. When he realizes he's in a, he's in a bind, we see a lot of single, we see that single shoulder shrug and a lot of movement right after that. And the line of questioning now gets him and he makes hard eye contact where he's been avoiding eye contact. He makes really hard eye contact. We always say the most common misunderstanding or misconception or myth in body language is that a person doesn't look you in the eyes when they're lying. In fact, often they look you hard in the eyes. Scott, what do you got? All right. <clears throat> he's got a quite, quite a few things um, going against him here at the very beginning. He's in his robe, probably has nothing up under there. And he comes out and Mark, like you were saying, Greg, what you're referring to, when they tell him sit down, that cat just drops. So that lets you know what? That he's been he's this is this is not new to him being bossed around like that by a police officer. So he's used to that. So that tells us a lot, or I would assume that <clears throat> so far. Also, I think the most horrific thing that could have happened here, for I think for for anyone watching and us as well, is if he had sat down and we'd gotten a, a shot up that robe i think i think the vomiting wouldn't have stopped for days um if that had actually happened i think that would have been that would have been horrible horrific but there are a lot of single shoulder shrugs he's got he's got a lot of this going on the voice volume is low but his cadence is fast and these are all cues of nervousness because he, he's he's not sure yet, but he's pretty sure that he knows you know something's up because when they start asking him, but he knows in a couple of seconds. So 
plenty of odd nervous gestures and a big swallow, and he's adapting as well. So we, we're talking about things that happened, some of them eight years ago, but he's still getting worked up about that because, like you were saying, Greg, he's been thinking about that. He's he's try, he's he's got a story. He's got the idea for the story he's going to tell, but he hasn't structured it yet. And so it's just, this is the beginning of it. It's starting to come out. So when he says, what's his name? Those eyes get wide and his voice volume gets louder. I'm getting darker. His voice volume gets louder and his tone gets a little bit higher and he starts wiggling around again. So you're right, Greg, they've, they've hit on something here. So something's, something's up with this part. And then his hands go from clasped, clasped in front of him uh, there at the beginning to full arms crossed. Uh, you know, he's, he's good doing the full arms crossing. Quite often we'll tell you about how arms crossed mean nothing. In this case, I think it means a little something. He has nothing to bury her with when he comes out there and sits down in nothing but a robe on the, on the steps of his porch. So he's he's struggling to get some kind of a barrier between himself and, and the cops. And I think that's about all he's got. That's all I got. Nice. Uh, how long has the subject been sending you photographs, by the way? Uh, For about two weeks. Once he found excellent. out we were doing this, he <laughs> immediately, yeah. I immediately started getting them. I've got him well, saying. I don't know why I'm you're glad you suffered the vomiting yeah. and nobody else did. But <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for looking at taking a good look at those. Yeah, yeah it's part of my job. Checking yeah. the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> How you doing? Is Martha here? No, uh, she's probably at her boyfriend's house. What's your name, bud? David. David. David Callaghan. All right, come on down here for me. Just have a seat if you would. Why do you think she's at her boyfriend's house? Oh, that's where she stays most of the time. Where's that at? I don't know. I don't even know who it is, what? really. I mean, Are you the only one here? I um, mean, the dog. Yeah. You and the dog? I mean, she's here maybe a couple times a week anymore. I mean, we've oh. actually been split up for a year. We've been in separate bedrooms yeah, for the last year. Right. Let me get your social real quick. Um, uh, she's schizophrenic. She's been off her medication, on and off her medication. I don't know how many times. You know what I mean? Everything's top secret. Her, uh, I guess her and her daughter's fighting again. Six oh four to computer. So. Well, that's part of the reason we're out here because no one in her family's talked to her since July. I don't know how. I know. I know she's texted her. No, she hasn't. Times. She has another phone besides that. It's uh, nice. Well, nice who are you seat. getting texts from? Huh? Who are you getting texts from? I'm, her? She had, no, she hasn't. I mean, I see her very randomly here. You know, the, the house is in her name. We got the house eight years ago. Right. I mean, I'm making arrangements to move off slow, but sure, I just, I just don't have the money. You know right. I mean? Trying to, like I said, I, I know she's seen somebody else. I've, I've dated. What's his name? I don't even know. I've never met him. Where does he live at? I don't know. I have no idea. What does he live in Akron? I would think so. You would think so, but you don't know. No, I don't. Is I she don't in know. Ohio? Yeah, as far as I know, yes. When's the last time you talked to her? I don't know. Probably. Five, six days ago, maybe. And where was that at? That was here. She I stopped see, I up see, here. I see her passing. I was leaving. She came out. Keep trying to cram it down my throat. I don't care what you're doing. <laughs> I agree with that, too. Um, Did you guys but, celebrate last year? Yeah, I believe we, we went gambling out there right across from Home Depot. Uh, it's called the Palms. Mm. Um, Get them all shut down. Yeah, they are. I, I think they are. Shut down. I, I was kind of glad that sometimes I didn't go where I'm, you know, when I lose, I'm a poor sport. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> you know, I, but I would never, I mean, I've always basically been pretty poor my whole life anyway. You know, it's always been a struggle keeping paying the bills, this or that or the other. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've, I've broken both legs, both arms. You know, I'm lucky I'm not in a wheelchair from my last accident falling off a ladder in the house, but I mean, that's why I get disability now. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, on a good day, I can, you know, walk normally like anybody else, but that's about it. Uh, that's when, when they had me in that holding cell back yeah. then, I thought I was about to seize up. I'm sorry it took so long. 
I think they, you're good. the only one, so I think they'll take you back as soon as we're done. Because so. I'm thinking I, I didn't have anything else in court. I know I didn't do right. anything else wrong. <laughs> it's just easier. <laughs> it's easier for us to get you over here instead of because the patrol guys are so busy. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously her family's real worried about her and loves her a lot, and I can see that you love her a lot, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean. All right. Well, Dave, I think there's some little piece missing here, but that's what I think. Um, and I, I, I think you'd feel better if you just told us what it is. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to say. Well, I, I think I there's a little bit more to the story, Dave, that you're not giving us. I don't, there's nothing else I can tell you. I mean, I've told you everything I know. All right, Greg, what do you got? He starts off by saying something about cramming it down his throat. He's talking about religion because his in-laws are Jehovah's Witnesses and didn't celebrate birthdays, if that's a question for any of you. So it clears, clears that up, means nothing. It's just him trying to build rapport. He is doing something. When you do Sharfian interrogation, you run into people all the time who have two lives or who are trying to hide something. When you do intelligence interrogation, and people often think of intelligence interrogation as like World War II, when you got all these masses of soldiers that you capture, and they, have, you know, you have badges and all this kind of stuff, and you know who they are. But intelligence interrogation also plays heavily on unknown perpetrators and that kind of thing, because we round up chasing your war, especially my war in the first Gulf War. We round up people who are not military as well. We have to figure out who they are, what part they're playing. They're paramilitary. They're insurgents. There are all kinds of stuff going on. So there's a lot of trying to discern, and most people are smart enough to design a second life. Or if they're terrorists, they're not, they don't have terrorist costumes. They might work in an ice cream store. They may be a cook, a fry cook. You just don't know. And what they try to do is to come at you with a humanizing side up front. And that pity approach works really well often. This guy was poor. He's broken every bone in his body. Those are both pity approaches. The guy on the left, however, who we'll, we'll see becomes kind of lead interrogator is kind of indifferent. This we usually associate with authority or indifference when a person's sitting like that listening to your pity story. This guy doesn't read that, or maybe he does and he understands it. And the one on the right is going to start the good cop, bad cop workout. This is one of the best Sharfian interrogations you're ever going to see. We're going to talk about this interrogation longer than it took for them to break this guy. Less than an hour they broke this guy using these tools. And now that other cop's ramping up. They Chase, you say this all the time. They do a grand job of separating us and them. They make it about patrolmen, not about him. And then this cop is not really a great actor, the one who is going, are you a heartless bastard and that kind of stuff. But it doesn't seem to matter to the source. The source is feeling it, and you can see it. Um, I, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. There's a ton of body language. I'll hand that off to one of you, Scott, and let you go from there. But I'm going to talk about right. interrogation geek on it. Yeah. Okay. Well, speaking of interrogation, uh, this is these are <clears throat> this is a different kind of interrogation that I, that I'm used to usually doing. I don't do sharpie, and I do the read technique. And read technique, you do your own. You make your own and sure. make it your own. And uh, so, and Greg's talking about this the sharpie and technique and the Sharfian skills that you need for that. So my thing is is completely different than the way Greg sees it and, and approaches it. And so I think me, uh, me and Chase both are more read people than we are Sharfian. I, I think in there, right? Chase, wouldn't you say? I'd say read is a sharp derivative. It is oh, it is. For sure. It is. But yeah, I'm talking is. about pure, yeah. right in the, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I lean to, to read. Yeah, me too. Anyway, so even though this guy's handcuffed, his body language is fairly open. You know, he's trying, and what he's trying to do is trying to fit in and trying to to get along with these guys and, and feel like you know everything's fine. So he's mirroring them uh, quite often in these little situations. So and it's always interesting to me when somebody says, "I'm not going to lie to you." Really? Why are you here, pal? Because he's he's going to lie silent enough. But when they do that, it's not good because it entrenches them in that thing where they have to keep fighting for for their ego to show that they're not lying, they're being that they're being honest. They've been being honest the whole time. So then he tries to get sympathy by talking about his health problems. So he's going for it, man. He's he's swinging for the fences, trying to trying to latch on to something here, but they're not letting him. And like you were saying, Greg, the guy with his arms behind his head, not the greatest actor in the world, but man, he's executing this so well. He, and they're setting him up. You know, because the other guy's being all quiet and stuff. And, and this guy's being, I don't know, man. And you see him start getting worked up when he starts rubbing his head and all that. We'll get into that in a few minutes because he does a great job at that. And he says, I don't know what to say. And that's true. He doesn't know what to say. 
because he hasn't prepared yet. He's got a lie he's going to tell. He's going to tell us a big story about what what happened and, and what's actually going on, but he's not ready. So he should, he should have prepared himself a little bit better for this. Now, there's a perfect, this is a perfect beginning to the real interrogation, in my opinion, because he 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 drops it out there that there that that detective there's there's some there's a piece missing here there's a little piece missing in here somewhere but there's a big piece missing a bunch of them the heck is going on in my light I think I've got on auto I've got to quit doing that auto lighting this makes me look weird anyway so um so it's I think it's great I think I think the beginning of that of this thing is great and then um, I, as this thing unfolds, you'll see this. Watch that detective on the right because he starts getting more worked up and more worked up. He does it in real life. He's already as, as worked up as he's going to be, but he's trying to show he is. He's acting. But he's doing a good job, even though even though it's so obvious. But this guy's not, not catching it. I think he's buying it. I agree with you, Greg. I think he's buying it. Chase, what do you got? For the first time, I disagree. I think this is one of the worst interrogations I've ever seen. Uh, he jumps way too fast to try to get this close and try to get into a monologue. Uh, so I haven't seen the interview yet, uh, but this guy on the left is doing this Chris Watts arms in the air kind of pose. And I think it's might be due to nervousness. And I think he may, might also be using this to show how in charge and how aloof he is. And I think it's a weird, awkward attempt at what we call a dominance display. The detective on the right here is incredibly nervous. You can see that how rapidly he's jerking his body movements all over the place. And when we feel fear, it speeds our body up. Our blink rate speeds up, our shutter speed, our movement of our body, our heart rate, our attentional movement, which is where we do what's called ventral orientation to like a sound or something in the room. So when the police ask if he uh, still loves her a lot, this is when everything falls apart. So when somebody you don't really love and, and most reasonable people would say that they don't really love someone a lot, when somebody defaults to going along with exactly what's offered that would make them seem like a good person, then two things are happening. Number one, they're covering something up. Two, they're also revealing how easy it is uh, is going to be to appeal to them influence them in the interrogation room. So different people are like different locks. There's no such thing as a master key. So you need to understand who you're speaking to. That is one of the biggest, most enormous mistakes you're going to see throughout this entire interrogation. I'm going to point out every single part of it. Uh, if you don't do this, you're going to fall on your face. Most people just call this luck. And I think some people know better. And I think the reason that we're going to see what we're going to see in the future videos is what I call a hyper authority response. He's hyper responsive to authority. And he's a very submissive uh, personality uh, in general. You saw him with the police officer, very similar behavior with the interrogators. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I'm going to agree. Um, these guys, well, so they're not great performers, but if you're, you know, amateur actors, the village hall, uh, you can get quite a good result. In it. And so we can see, from our view, we can see past them. We can see this is the image of I'm bigger than you thought I was, making yourself vulnerable. It also releases scent from here as well. So the dominant, the dominant scent that you're producing gets into people's nostrils quicker. You've got, you've got the other guy literally crushing the bottle and throwing it down. So that state, look, look how I can crush a bottle. I would say this, if they weren't with somebody who is so passive, and responds to that dominance, they maybe wouldn't get the result that they're about to get. That might be a bit of a spoiler, actually. But but my view on it would be it, they are they're in a good position here, playing two of them playing dominance because they have somebody who's going to respond to that with sub dominance. What would happen if they had somebody who responded to that with more dominance? What would they do then? Well, we're only going to see the interview that we see, but. Look, I'm bigger than you thought I was. Those wings coming out, the, the crotch display, the distribution of, of scent there, uh, the bottle crushing. Uh, we also get, I mean, what terrible acting. The guy makes a little mark on a piece of paper, turns it over and turns it over again. That's what we used to do in examinations when we didn't know what the hell we were doing and trying to pretend, you know, that we knew the answers. It's it's 
terribly bad acting. We're going to see from uh, the, the brown shirted guy such indirect movement that if that was happening in a room with me, I would be worried for the person. I'd be going, do you not know what you're what you're doing? Now, luckily, he doesn't have somebody in the room who's going to say, mate, do you not know what you're doing? You all right? Do you need do you need a bit of help on this one? Um, and we're going to see we're going to see these two call each other out and end up arguing with each other in the end. So look, I they're going to get the result that they're going to get. We're going to we're going to see them get that that result. Uh, it would be different with somebody else in the room. Luckily for me, you know, they have a somebody who we've seen from the first video responds in a very certain way uh, to dominant people in the room. That's all I got on that one. And dominant smells. And dominant smells. Yeah, well, they want to be in does, the room with that smell. You just described what interrogation is. It's understanding the person you're talking to and going at them. I yeah. think they know this guy's going to respond to bad acting and to authority and to that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and I don't think it's luck, but we'll get through it and watch through the whole thing. I think this, it's a very Sharfian approach. This will be a good one. Yeah, yeah this will be good yeah. because we're we're, we're up, upstairs. They're going to disagree with downstairs on a lot of stuff. <laughs> So this will be, this will never, be never go, never go against the servants upstairs. And, and, never try and compete with downstairs. It's on, man. <laughs> it's it's a good on one. It is a good one. I like it for that reason. Yeah, me too. Hey, but check this out, Mark. Do you know what they call it when they do this? Do you know what that's called? The Cobra. Yeah, I read a, I read a whole thing on, on sleep and why people do that. And they think they're, they think they've uh, connected personality types to the way you sleep and all that. And it's, it's, you know, but they call that the Cobra. I've seen, and I saw I, I it more once is why who, I say Who are they is, is my question. Yeah, that's why who I say they. they. Yeah. 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 Keep trying to cram it down my throat. I don't care what you want. <laughs> I agree with that, too. Did you guys celebrate last year? Yeah, I believe we, we went gambling out there right across from Home Depot. Uh, it's called the Palms. Mm. Uh, Get them all shut down. Yeah, they are. Yeah, I, I think they are. Shut down. I, I was kind of glad that sometimes when you go where I'm, you know, when I lose, I'm a poor sport. I mean, I'm not going to lie. You know, I, but I would never, I mean, I've always basically been pretty poor my whole life anyway. You know, it's always been a struggle keeping paying the bills, this or that or the other. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've, I've broken both legs, both arms. You know, I'm lucky I'm not in a wheelchair from my last accident falling off a ladder in the house, but I mean, that's why I get disability now. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, on a good day, I can, you know, walk normally like anybody else, but that's about it. That's when, when they had me in that holding cell back yeah. there, I thought I was about to seize up. I'm you know, sorry, it took so long. I think they, you're right. the only one, so I think they'll take you back as soon as we're done. Because so. I'm thinking I, I didn't have anything else in court. I know I didn't do right. anything else wrong. <laughs> it's just easier <laughs> It's easier for us to get you over here instead of because the patrol guys are so busy. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously her family is real worried about her and loves her a lot, and I can see that you love her a lot, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all right. Well, Dave, I think there's some little piece missing here, but that's what I think. Um, and I, I, I think you'd feel better if you just told us what it is. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to say. Well, I, I, I think I there's a little bit more to the story, Dave, that you're not giving us. I don't, there's nothing else I can tell you. I mean, I've told you everything I know. Yeah. Mm hmm. There's one thing I would mentioned. This is like a we're gonna we're gonna see if we fully fully believe you or not, Dave. We're gonna have a little exercise if you play along with us. <sighs> Here, let me take that one. There'd be one more. There we go. This will be a honesty tester. If you would, could you grab that pen for me? Yeah. Yeah. 
and write your sister's name like five times. Twenty times. Twenty? Is that the magic number? Thank you. SRES building, Dave, like I said, it's, it runs, it actually, really, I know, it runs, this building is connected to the, the steam plant, the Akron steam plant down by the zoo, the archaic way that we heat and cool, um, we heat and cool buildings, and it's pretty much this building is either freezing ass cold or sweating ass hot. Um, I was going to just ask you one. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, look, this is just an example for me around how compliant this subject is. If you would, for me, grab that pen. Immediately he grabs it. No further instruction. He's not, he's not waiting to say, and what do you want me to do? What, stick it in my eye? Like, what, what are you going to tell me to do next? Other people would wait and wait to find out what this is going to be about before they even start to comply. He doesn't need to wait. He's straight into it. Um, again... The, here's the indecision. Uh, I'd like you to write five times. The partner says 20 times. Yeah, 20 times. It's like, which one is it? What have you organized, guys? Yeah, I don't care. Like, what are you, what are you doing? Like, I would be, number one, I'll pick up the pen when I want to pick up the pen. And for what do you want me to do with it? And number one, can you get your act together on this and work out how many times this should be done to be forensically accurate? Or this is nonsense, isn't it? If it, if it can be five, if you think it can be five times, but he wants it 20, like which one is it? Which one is it? So for me, this does suggest that we have somebody very, very compliant and some people who haven't really put their act together and are willing to argue in front of each other around it. And it doesn't make any difference. They still get the effect that they need to get. So would I, would I with these two? go, I think we can put them into any situation. I think they're solid, and I think they could deal with anybody. No, I don't think they're really organizing anything uh, out there, and I think they're they're getting lucky with this act that they've got at the moment. Uh, Chase, what do you think on this one? Totally agree. Uh, but in the suspect, there's no anger. He's not upset about the test at all. Hyper compliant, afraid to ask even why the test is necessary. He's afraid to say that a test like this is absolute bullshit. And he doesn't want to say he didn't do anything. He doesn't want to say that he didn't do anything. This isn't necessary. Why am I in handcuffs? I shouldn't be here. I don't deserve to be here. All that stuff we should hear. And he, the number one thing here, he's build rapport. He's trying to maintain some kind of rapport with these guys. That's all I got. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I think he does try a positive um, declaration of innocence or positive denial, strong positive denial at one point. But one of the things you got to be careful with, and this is a thing that we say all the time. This a strong, yeah, I think he does. I think he does in this one. I think he says, I didn't do anything. He actually comes out with a little bit more strength and says, you know, he's not exactly – I. He has no idea when they first doing compliance testing with him. And the compliance testing, I'll come back to that in just a second, the strong positive denial. But in the compliance testing piece, I think most people think they can train a person in the interrogation room by saying, Mark, pick this up and forcing you to do it. I think that's almost always useless. It is a test, it is a great compliance test. And you're right on. As soon as they say it, he picks it up and he does what he's told. So they know they're going to be able to try it. One of the things that people are really good at when they know the system, when they know interrogation, they're, they're going to do exactly what you said, Chase. They're going to try to be cooperative or appear to be cooperative. 
it's at the heart of all resistance training, oddly enough, is I need to be compliant enough that you don't want to hurt me and you don't want to do things to me. So I'm going to try to make you think that I'm helping. This guy's doing that. There's a thing that we always say that a strong lack of a strong positive denial is a red flag. We all agree with that. But simply making up strong positive denial is not a evidence of innocence. It is an indicator that you look for a lack of that being there, not the opposite. So any person who's been in trouble before knows that they have to go and go and go and go to try to build rapport with you. They're inoculated against law enforcement. I think that is what we're part partially seeing here is he's going to try to talk his way out of it. And the reason that you can't give a brand new interrogator, a brand new interrogator, put them out in the field and have them screen people for who's a good guy and a bad guy, for example, and I'll talk a little bit about screening, is you need a lot of experience, not a checklist. A checklist doesn't work. We know that. And Chase, this is to your point. If you handed everything that you know on a checklist to a guy who's not been trained to use it, it falls through because they'll look and they'll say, strong positive denial. Okay, he's innocent. And that's the way their brain works. It's not enough experience. So as we're walking through this and we're paying attention, remember that everything that we're using has an opposite side too. And a person who's experienced with the criminal justice system is going to know, hey, I better do this, I better do that, I better do this. That's partially the compliance mark. He's been here enough times. I also think he's defeated. He knows he's beaten when he comes in the door. And when you present him with the right level of we know all, you win. And I think they know that. And I would, I'd love to see what their close rate is because I don't know whether they're good outside of this interrogation. They may not be good at any other approach, but they're not using read at all. And we also know there's a big push not to use read in a lot of jurisdictions now. So I'd be interested in what Akron does. If one of you guys is watching, I'd love to hear what your close rate is and what Akron does for technique. Maybe it's one of those places that said no more read. But I think we're seeing a good job of doing this compliance testing, seeing it works, knowing they have him. We see him do that strong positive denial. I'd go back and look and we'll double check it. But I think he does. And it's just he's trying his best to get out. I don't think he's a real smart guy either. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I don't think he's smart either. And I agree with you. And and as far as Reed goes, like what I'm talking about when I train it, it's or I train in a, in that fashion. I don't go right down that that list because for me, even you it's can't. uncomfortable. Yeah. So it it, it doesn't, you know. Some people do it. It works. It works for them. But that's why a lot of it doesn't work because we've we've seen people on here use it and it just goes right in the commode for them. You know, just doing it wrong. So, and by doing it wrong, is there as they go through each step, they follow the protocol. They're just sticking right with what the book says, and that's it. And that's all they're doing. So, I'm not going to add anything else because you guys covered everything.
why they keep it so cold in here. Jesus. Um, it's a sorry ass building, Dave. Like I said, it, it runs. It actually, if you really want to know, it run. This building is connected to the the steam plant, the Akron steam plant down by the zoo. The archaic way that we heat and cool. Um, we heat and cool buildings, and it's pretty much this building is either freezing ass cold or sweating ass hot. Um, I was gonna just ask you one. Um, I was gonna just ask you one more thing, just to make sure they're happy. Can you do it on the line and just maybe skip every other box and just do like the two rows? Dave, let me ask you a question. And I appreciate your honesty. You've been very cool with us and cooperative and everything else. Are you a heartless bastard? Uh -huh. A heartless, cold bastard? No. No. Okay. So you wouldn't want people to think that about you, right? That you're just a heartless, cold bastard, right? No, I don't. Okay. There, there's some pieces missing to your story, Dave. And, and, and this, why we had you write this out, is the key. So, because that's your handwriting, and that's just that, that you just wrote your sister's name to me. I brought it back. The problem, Dave. Problem. Well, there's a problem is this is August. And as you know, that is your girlfriend, the love of your life, Robin's handwriting. I said August. That was last month. That is September, where you paid the rent. So we can keep up this farce that Robin is still around. Correct? Okay, I've done this. I've done this numerous times for okay. Well, you told me earlier you've never done it. So you think you've never asked me if I've gotten a money order for her. He did ask you this. So I did when, ask you if you ever made the payment. Yeah. So Dave I did here, I did make the payment. Here's That's the when question. got the money order and gave it back to her. Here's the question. Here's the question. Here's the You're question. you didn't even know how much it was. Here's the question. You're saying you didn't even know how much it cost. You did say Be Are you a heartless, no good no. bastard? Are you, you a heartless, you never asked no me if good I went and did bastard? That. He hey. did ask you. Yeah, if, if I made the payment to my he sister. I never made the payment to my sister. I went down, I walked down the speedway and got this for Robin. I've done it for numerous, happened, numerous times. That's not what happened, Dave. Okay. All right, Greg, what do you got? <laughs> so this is classic all the time in intelligence. We don't know who we're talking to. Unlike here where they're after a confession, we may not even know facts. We're just suspicious. When we get the person in, we have to start poking and prodding. And what we typically do, and you know, in my world, we get into, we would get to the point of needing confessions too, but I don't care. I don't care what you did. Quite candidly, I want to know what your friends are going to do next. That's the reason we, what we do is important that way. So we can get a confession and tear it up and throw it away. Meanwhile, the guy standing in the back of the room with a badge is going to come talk to you when we're done. It's just the way it works. We're after information that becomes actionable intelligence. And if we have confession for something, okay, we'll hand you off to the right guy. And when we're doing that, we know all, and it works, like I said earlier, best on people who are not very smart. We may build a fallen dossier is another approach we call it. And it's just, we all have it, your BS book or whatever you want to call it, Scott. Everybody uses it in every form of interrogation. I think he's just not smart. And... He's either dumb or he's forgotten. I, this guy's just, he doesn't do anything until this guy does a whole, that cold bastard comment. And then he starts self-grooming. He's barriered. He's anchoring anything he can control. He's grabbing everything in his within his reach, like water bottle and his clothing. And he's adjusting it and controlling it. This guy's probably in some pretty strong terror or pretty strong fight or flight. And so now whatever brain he brought to the fight is also gone. And this guy now starts on PE down, Project, that's Pride and Ego down. He's driving into him and saying, You're a worthless piece of crap, and, and, and. And then the threat and re rescue starts. The bigger guy starts to be a little bit more friendly. He's not been friendly to now, starts to be a little bit more friendly. And when this guy realizes what happens, you see his posture shift, and then he starts parsing words. 
Uh, he, now he's going to get himself into a bind because he's going to get to a place where there is nothing he can do because he's going to talk about a word. They're going to take it away. This is why I think they do understand what they're doing. They take that word, that thing he said, tear it up, hand it back to him. And that looks good. Then his voice is constrained as he actually says, OK, he's asking for approval of these officers. To your point, both your points about how compliant this guy is, they, he's eating out of their hands. So this is going to work for them and they're going to get exactly what they're after. Chase, what do you got? Yeah. So I agree. And the detective is also uh, going to maybe a method that he saw on TV. And I don't say this in judgment at all because I've, I've been there. We train police in interrogation. And very often uh, when we show up, it's the first time they're hearing about all these methods that we teach. And the method he's using here is called social perception avoidance. So that's what he's using is like people are going to see you a certain way. It's most effective when it's used on teens and women over 35 statistically. And this is not the situation or the time for this to come out in the conversation. So when they make the accusation that defensiveness is all about these specific items and he's willing to negotiate on small things because he's un unwilling to talk about a larger issue. I'm talking about the suspect here now. When somebody's missing and someone's called in to be questioned about it and then signatures are compared and they'll openly and immediately talk about whether or not they sign a check or something. And then they will be completely comfortable asking how is this relevant or openly saying that these accusations are ridiculous. But when somebody drills down on these minute details and they want to stay there in those details, you've got a problem on your hands because that's where they want you to be focused. So you need to bring them back up and move on because they're going to get more and more comfortable in this room because the missing person is not being discussed. It's about the signature, which makes them more comfortable. Even if it is a crime, it's a lot less than what they did. Scott, what do you got? All right. I think this is the introduction to guess what? I'm the bad cop. Because he looks and sounds frustrated over what's going on. This is where he starts to, to quote unquote, become unhinged almost, or as he as he's or not losing control, but barely keeping control, which I think is an act. I think I think he's totally under control. I think he knows exactly what he's doing, and I, and I personally think he's executing it well. I think it, I think it looks. I think for what's going on, and for that that guy's headset, that guy, what's going on in David's brain, I think it's perfect for that. And then David grabs that water and pulls it over and just holds on to it, doesn't do anything with it. He doesn't have anything else to barrier. But look how close to that table he is. We did a video on on uh, confidence and going to interviews and stuff. And Mark, you talked about uh, being uh, the, the distance from the table to, uh, and the person talk about that for a second. Yeah, you know, if you're confident, you'll take up more territory. And so one of the things you might do is with your resources, which is often food or water or pen or paper, the more confident you are, the further your resources will be from you because you don't feel you need to protect them. Nobody's going to go and come and steal them. You feel confident. You feel safe in the environment. There's no predators around you. So when people start drawing their resources in close, they're probably less confident. They feel that there is a more predatory environment. Perfect. Okay, great. Then uh, then David's voice gets all quiet. He doesn't say much at all because his brain is in, it's on high alert because he's gathering information at this point. He's trying to, he's, it hadn't quite dawned on him. He thinks they know a lot more than, than, than they're saying they know, but he's not quite sure yet. So he's gathering in the information to, to make that decision, I think. And he's prepping for his answer. And then I think the detective does a great job of being dismissive. With it, you know, with his as he's handing the paper to David, doesn't even look at him, you know, and then, and then he gets all loud and stuff. I think I think that's a I think that tactic is working, and I think it's really good because we talk about boxing somebody in. You're watching it happen. This is the beginning of them getting him right there and starting to slowly scooch him toward the corner so he can't get out. And I think it's working. And maybe they don't know any other technique than this. Maybe this is maybe this is their first time doing it. But I think they're executing it well. I, I think it, I think it's working, uh, Greg. What do you got? I think I've already got. Oh, Mark, yeah. shoot. Okay. Yep. Uh, yeah. Look, for me, it just looks like a bit of a bun fight. I don't know who's in control here. I don't. Know, I don't think anybody knows who's in control here. I mean, yeah, I get your idea that you know probably somebody's trying to act like they might be erratic, 
but there's there's times when they're actually erratic and where the other doesn't understand why the other is being erratic. They're talking over the top of each other. All three of them are talking at one point. Nobody has the ball in their hand. Nobody's taking control. Now, maybe that's a ploy. Maybe they stepped outside and they went, let's do that thing where everybody starts talking all together, including that. But given how bad they are at acting, how bad they are at acting and how real that bit is, that's not an act. Nobody's in control at times of this, okay? Unless they have this brilliant way of slipping from being bad actors to really, really good ones, which I don't know how they've managed that because they are really bad, okay? I do, so for me, there are times when their bad acting is clear and I see the ploy that they're trying to play. And, and like you say, Scott, if it is their first time uh, doing this, yeah, maybe it's like, wow, what's happening here? Who's in control? Uh, am I talking? Are you talking? Oh, is he talking? Like, who's, who's, and then they regain it for a moment because maybe it is a first time for them uh, doing this. But, but to say, look, you know, they really, really know what they're doing here. Uh, there are times when I believe nobody's in control of this situation. They stumble on some pretty damn good technique if they've never done or never been exposed to it. A clock is, I, is correct twice a day. So here's what I think this is. This is what I think this is. Let's say Mark has a briefcase with 200 K in it. He wants a red Ferrari, Ferrari X 39, or, you know, whatever the name is of a Ferrari. I do. He's right. got it picked out. Mark He's knows the it. Ferrari is there. He knows the Ferrari is right there in Toronto in the Ferrari dealership. He walks into the door, sits down and says, I want that Ferrari right there. And then the entire dealership celebrates this guy for being the best salesperson of the month. Like his sales skills are so insane. But it was the it was the customer, not the salesman. It did all the work. Oh, agreed. However, think about how many times we have watched a guy sit there and go, not going to do that or get an attorney or something else. It's a combination. I agree with you. Mm. And it has to be a combination or it wouldn't work. I mean, if they came in and immediately did something else, he might just sit there and go, nah, 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 nah. that's what interrogation is to me. I think they whether they stumble into the right approach or not, it works on this guy. And oh, it is not. It that's is undeniable. Not. Is yeah, not it's undeniable that it works. Yeah. I mean, look, yeah. there's no bad behaviors. There's just results. And they got the result that they were looking for. The question is, could they do it again and again and again? And it, well, that we don't know. You can you know, use it. Hope, yeah, we do. We've you got can, to hope that they're not they're not sitting there right time, now. Because it won't they're work not, on, every, on everybody every time because everybody's different. I think different. they do. So, I think so yeah, is, we've got to hope they're not sitting at home right now going, that's what me and Bob do every time. Like we do, and yeah. It's every time. It's not sharp. Time. Like me, yeah. But that's just Bob. Like Bob's always like that. Bob's, that's the assumption. Bob's just belligerent. Yeah. Bob's just the belligerent guy. But watch how they don't change no, Sorry, character. Bob. I know your name. characters don't change at all. The guy who's all worked up stays all worked up. The other guy remains that character. Those are I behavioral patterns of people. Yeah. I understand what it is, but I've done these a lot, and I understand what's happening. I see exactly what's happening. I understand what's happening. Maybe that's the, maybe that's the thing. Maybe, I'm, um, maybe in my opinion, I'm the only one that sees it. But I think, I think doing you're a great so job well educated. I think you're so well educated in interrogation that you're seeing methods being applied when they may not be. Or, or vice versa. This Here's the thing. We don't know for sure. I'd love to see their close rate, know what they do. Oh. I agree with you. Yeah. Because if they – look, I, I've known a lot of bad actors who are good interrogators. And just depends, right, if they've been trained or not. Do they stumble in here? And I agree with you, Chase. If they always go in and go, it's your fault. We got all this. Uh, yeah. And they happen to have a picture. Yeah, I think then there's no, no elegant method whatsoever to it. But I think they do a good job here. Yeah, we just disagree on this one. And who do you all think you are fussing with us upstairs? <laughs> yeah, it makes me sick. Upstairs, no, I, I like what can I call that the nosebleeds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're in the front row. It's much brighter downstairs. Yeah. It's much lighter down here. Like, like have you seen the views and like, the I don't want you to come down here sometimes. Yeah, well, I, I like the fact we got one that we we are doing something different. We see <laughs> things differently. Yeah. What my intent? My intent was just to find something for the week that looked interesting. Well, they, because you've got the people that are right up here today. I'm just the people who are 
don't know what they're talking about. That, I'm uh, excited to send you guys screenshots of all the comments that goes, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Greg and Scott are way off. <laughs> yeah. 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 We're going to tally me. them. We're going to tally them. Go look. Yeah. Start right look. now. You should Evidence. put in the comments. Yeah. yeah. What it oh, while well, you're at it. Yeah. While you're at it, just subscribe so we know that you care enough to tell us. What's yeah, yeah. Supposed to yeah. Write subscribe, or wrong. subscribe, and write down below how 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 much of a jerk Scott and Greg are. That's what I want you to do. Like write we down. Did, like, do Ali, not like and go for it. With everyone, go yeah. for it. Come on, in. Scott, go, go in there. Go, yeah. <laughs> go in there talk, and fuss with. Them. We talked to YouTube, and we actually made it free to subscribe to our channel. Subscribe. Oh yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's completely, completely free. free. Yeah, it's yeah, a good yeah. Move. It was yeah, free. It's totally free. Totally free. Yeah. I was amazed they did that for us. Yeah. I was amazed. You know what's did. interesting they did. is they did. I, I, I think a lot of people don't subscribe because they don't have an account and a way to oh. subscribe. Oh, it's really easy oh. to create a quick account and be able to go in and subscribe. I have friends oh. who tell me they yeah. didn't Google so obsessed with collecting data that they'll make you get an account. I don't know. No, you can watch. That's what I'm saying. You can't subscribe without it. I don't think that's the problem. Yeah, for a lot of people you can watch. Yeah. You can watch. Yeah. You can and watch, that's but why, you can't subscribe. That's why we have, you know, like those odd names, like when I get after people and I think they're a bot and they're not, because he's like, right. double Cindy, one zero seven two, it's some guy, you know, and I'm like, who do you think you are? They're like, who do you think you are? And I'm like fussing with them. Oh, I love that. Yeah, leave yeah, us Scott alone. The leave us too. alone and get yourself in the comments. Start yeah. annoying people in the comments. <laughs> yeah. Look, yeah, we're free service. Go after the people there, Scott. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I was going to just ask you one more thing, just to make sure they're happy. Can you do it on the line and just maybe skip every other box and just do like the two rows? Dave, let me ask you a question. And I appreciate your honesty. You've been very capitalist and cooperative and everything else. Are you a heartless bastard? Uh -huh. A heartless coal bastard? No. No. Okay. So you wouldn't want people to think that about you, right? That you're just a heartless coal bastard, right? No, I don't. Okay. There, there's some... Pieces missing to your story, Dave. And, and and this, why we had you write this out, is the key. So, because that's your handwriting. And that's just that, that you just wrote your sister's name 20. I brought it back. The problem, Dave. Problem. Well, there's a problem is this is August. And as you know, that is your girlfriend, the love of your life, Robin's handwriting. I said August. That was last month. That is September, where you paid the rent. So we can keep up this farce that Robin is still around. Correct? Okay, I've done this. I've done this numerous times for okay. Well, you told me earlier you've never done it. So you think, you've never asked me if I've gotten a money order for her. He did ask you this. I so didn't ask you if you ever made the payment. Yeah. So Dave, I did. I did make the payment. Here's I went and got the money order and Here's gave it back to her. Here's the question. Here's the question. You're saying you didn't even know how much it was. Here's the question. You're saying you didn't even know how much it cost. You did. Say Be Are you a heartless, no. no good no. bastard? Are you, you a heartless, you never asked no me if good I went and did bastard? That. He did ask you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I made the payment to my yeah, sister. Yeah. I never made the payment to my sister. I went down. I walked down the speedway and got this for Robin. I've done it for numerous, happened, numerous times. That's not what happened. Dave. Okay. Tell us the part about destroying her phone, being on her phone, pretending that you're her. Oh God. Tell us about I, that. I don't part. have her phone. Where's her I phone? I did. I don't know. You know where her phone is. No, I don't. You put it. We found it where you put it. Why don't you just tell us the truth of what happened? You'll feel better. Did you guys share a bedroom? Better. I don't have a phone. Did you guys share a bedroom? At one time, yeah. Which bedroom? Front bedroom. I just, what color are your bed sheets? I don't know. I think they're black. I'm what sure. color are your pillowcases? Brown. 
They don't match or anything. I've gone down there numerous times. Uh, not every time. Just depend on how she feels. I think you'd really feel better, Dave, if you told the truth. You let it go. I've sat in this room. He sat in this room. We've talked to people. And it's like, because <sighs> otherwise, otherwise, people who would look at this, look at this event and say that you, Dave, are a heartless, no good bastard who put the love of your life in the ground. And that has to be an evil, bad person who has to go away for every last day of their life. Every last day. So, Dave, are you that person, or are you the person that has struggled with someone who's, as you said, for 16 years you love her, but she's schizophrenic and she goes here and she goes there? Because there's no reasonable person, Dave, in the world that wouldn't believe that you harmed Robin. We all know that three of us sitting in this room. You should just get it off your chest, man. I've told you everything I know. Well, we haven't told it. Did you the moment? Yeah. Did you plan it out? Hi, right, Chase. What do you got? So there's an overall lack of denial about everything, uh, but the possession of the phone. A lot of hygienic gestures, which means that we're trying to improve our appearance and how we look to other people or perception management. But when he says, "I've gone down there numerous times." Then he slaps his hand on the table. And this is one of my number one favorite, number top five giveaways that somebody is making up a story. Top five. It's not timed with any of the speech. And it is a random body part trying to look relaxed by flopping on the table. So this is not a regular behavior in any innocent person I've ever seen in my life. And keep in mind, Making YouTube videos is not our full-time job. We've been doing this for tens of thousands of hours long before this channel started. So I'm saying this little arm flop behavior is really huge when you see it. It's a good OJ sign. OJ did it too. OJ yeah. did it, remember? I remember that. Yeah. Yep. It's a good sign you're not getting the whole truth. And keep in mind, I'm not telling you to look for this in isolation. Think about everything we've seen up to this point. And then seeing this little arm flop. Uh, is is no longer an absolute. It's a huge cluster around the same topic. So there's tons of adapting behavior with this water bottle. And this is starting to look like a made-for-TV movie interrogation and kind of straight out of a TV show. Like, kind of out You're of You're holding TV. back, man. You're holding back. Come on, lay into us. Let's have yeah. it. I, I want to... I want to I want to offer the same thing that I would want to receive if somebody was critiquing me. So I'm not judging the person, judging the actions, and saying that he may not be responsible. Maybe the budget of the department. So Scott, what do you got? All right, yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, when he says about the phone, he says we found it where you put it. See, if he <laughs> thought they were lying at this point, he would have blown up. That's his. That's that should have been the spark. And you go, wait a minute, what are you talking? What are you talking about? I didn't do. We didn't see that at all nothing he laughs and he does that thing on the table you're you're right and then he covers himself with his arms and he starts fixing his shirt and goofing around with that so right then you get the two things in this one they could have said ah dude you're you're busted the second one i think is more potent than the first one when he asked him what the colors of his his bed sheets and his pillows were if you think for one minute that this guy has a wife and that she for one evening slept in a bed with black sheets and brown pillowcases without saying, what are you doing? You've lost your mind. There's there's anyone who's into decorating or decoration or understands the way those things are set up. Those things don't go together, black and, and brown, especially on a bed like that. Nobody's going to do that. That's when they should have said, dude, you're busted, man. Because even he says they don't match because he doesn't know what he's doing. He's a guy. He doesn't know how to put all that stuff on there. Some guys do, and they do it great, and they're good at it, Mark. But a lot of people aren't, you know, we don't have, we don't, we don't know, you know, so they're trying to appeal to his ego as well, because he, he keeps, he keeps harping on that thing about everyone's going to think you're a bad guy, an evil guy, you're just the worst guy, all that stuff. So they're trying to get into him to say, everybody's going to think this about you, man. Everybody's, you know, it's up. Everybody's going to think about you and he won't hush about it. He just keeps digging on that the whole time. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Uh, look, um, Chase, I'm so glad that you brought up the, the sound on the table because clients that I train who are 
usually in business or politics, and have got themselves into a little bit of hot water, a little bit of trouble, and they're going on TV, it's very hard to train them out of that um, that collapse gesture. Very hard to do. You can you can try and keep their hands as buoyant as possible, but in the end, the pressure of the interview will probably get them in the end. So what do I do? I make sure they take off any jewellery so that there is going to be no loud sound on the desk or on the table. There's going to be no jingle of jewellery because that will really uh, be be uh, unconsciously detected by the audience, that, that collapse. So, yeah, we do get that uh, collapse there. I think there's no doubt. There's no doubt that this guy uh, is 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 um, is lying <laughs> and has been involved in this from moment one. I kind of sussed it when he walked out in his dressing gown and, <laughs> and was, uh, you know, so protected and so and so compliant. However, let's have a look at these interviewers again, because for me, that's the most interesting uh, thing in this in this whole set of videos. Well, who's talking the most? In this, well, it's them, uh, for sure. And that's not usual for what we'd normally say about, hey, this is a great interrogation because, you know, the other, the, the subject is, is doing all the talking. In this case, they are absolutely monologuing on, on this one. And it is what I would call a tub thumping performance. It is histrionic. Um, I've, it's barnstorming I have here. It's a barnstorming. I mean, literally, he's going into, uh, I'm not sure whether it may have been the last the, the, the video that we're not doing just before this, but he goes into third circle completely on stuff. He's barn, he's literally flying through the air on this one. Um, it is Brad Pitt from 12 Monkeys. That's who we've got doing, which is one of the greatest barnstorming performances. It's utter nonsense yeah. what Brad Pitt does in 12 Monkeys, but you can't help but look at it because you're just there going, is 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 he going to do that throughout? Is he going to do that? He does. Does it throughout? He commits to it. This guy has committed to his barnstorming performance. And now, look, if 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 this is the result that they're trying to get through this particular act, this is the point I believe they hit it because the subject now is looking into a pit of despair. His, 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 uh, because it's, it's absurd what's happening in my mind in front of him now. It's without reason. And so I think we're moving for the subject into futility and resignation around, around this. Because if you've got somebody in front of you who is willing to give that level of tub thumping barnstorming performance you've got really nowhere to go unless you want to come up with an equal or bigger deal for them and it's a it's going to be a tough one to top this guy and so i think what we're going to see from now on is our subject just go into a spiral of futility um and luckily uh, or maybe by rhyme and reason and planning, he is exactly the person who will go into a pit of of futility. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Well, there's a reason he's in futility right now. And the reason is very simple. We know where you put her phone. Mm -hmm. OK, that means they've recovered her phone. You know that you buried her phone in your fire pit. Well, that looks pretty much like the gig is up, right? That's number one. Number two, the cop is looking at his phone at a picture, it appears, and he's saying, what color were your sheets? Guess why? He wrapped her in the sheets before he put her in the ground. They're building a picture. And this guy's not brilliant. If he were smart, he would shut up and say, I need a lawyer right here. But he's too far gone. And I agree with you. When he's when he gets him defeated, when he starts talking about bed linens is when you see it. And when he drops and you see that level of defeat come up like that. I, I think the guy on the right who's over the top and just doesn't care. I don't think he's a great actor, but I think he, I got a buddy named Bryce, who's really good at that over-the-top thing intentionally to make a point. And it made me think of him when he's being funny. And I think this guy may be being funny. I don't know. I'm not going to I'm not going to take away or give him anything. But whatever is he's doing, this guy's doing, is buying now because he's put his hands in his head and he's showing stress. There's one point in there where he adapts to the back of his neck, I think, too, when he's feeling the stress. But they've got him. And then the good cop even tries to throw him a bone and say, maybe it wasn't intentional. This is the first time the good cop has really tried to be a good cop. This tells you they are not looking for facts. They're not looking for facts. They've got facts. They know exactly where they're going with this case. They've got a body. They've got a cell phone. They've got a wrapping. They've, he's been under a fire, all kinds of this stuff. 
what they don't have is him saying, I did it. It's all they're after is I did it. And whatever it takes, let's see if they get there. I think you just nailed the whole thing there, man. Tell us the part about destroying her phone, being on her phone, pretending that you're her. Oh, God. Tell us about that I don't have her phone. Where's her phone? I don't know. You know where her phone is. No, I don't. You put it, we found it where you put it. Why don't you just tell us the truth of what happened? You'll feel better. Did you guys share a bedroom? I don't have a phone. Did you guys share a bedroom? At one time, yeah. Which bedroom? Front bedroom. I just, what color are your bed sheets? I don't know. I think they're black. I'm what sure. color are your pillowcases? Brown, I think. Uh, they don't match. I don't know. I've gone down there numerous times. Uh, not every time. Just depend on how she feels. I think you'd really feel better, Dave, if you told the truth. You let it go. I've sat in this room. He sat in this room. We talked to people. And it's like... Because otherwise, otherwise, people who would look at this, look at this event and say that you, Dave, are a heartless, no good bastard who put the love of your life in the ground. And that has to be an evil, bad person who has to go away for every last day of their life. Every last day. So, Dave, are you that person? Or are you the person that has struggled with someone who's, as you said, for 16 years, you love her, but she's schizophrenic, and she goes here, and she goes there? Because there's no reasonable person, Dave, in the world that wouldn't believe that you harmed Robin. We all know that three of us sitting in this room. You should just get it off your chest, man. I've told you everything I know. Well, we haven't told it. Did you the moment? Yeah. Did you plan it out? When you pretend to keep up the charade if, some, if someone's still alive by using her phone and you get rid Today's of Today's the day to tell your true story. It is the day to tell the true story. And whether you're a heartless bastard who needs put away for every day of the rest of their lives, or if it's something that's spun out of control and then you're like, well, I can't call the police. What do I say? What do I do? I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. But I know that I, the person I love more than anything in the world is gone. So, you know. You're used to having two incomes and you can't live with one income and maybe it was a heart attack and you had to do something and you're just, and people, the guy with Barbara just did that and had a mom. Sure. I just got my disability a year or so ago. I mean, we've struggled with less, way less than that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so it's not the money thing. I have nothing else to say. I told her that, you know. Well, you didn't tell us everything, you know. No, you didn't tell us how and why you killed her. Again, was it an argument? It was the heat of the moment? Passion? And then you're like, well, what do I do? Or you're a heartless bastard. You killed the woman you claim she loved more than you. anything you in the world. You defend yourself. Right. And you, you said she's schizophrenic. You said you never put your hands on her before. Did she ever put her hands on you? No. No? She has her daughter. She has her grandson. She has her... Tomorrow daughter. is her birthday. Tomorrow is her birthday for them to sit there and reflect. Yes. On the things that they had to see. The things they had to do. That you just... The agony they've been going through for the last month. Heartlessly killed the woman you love more than anything in the world. It's 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 mind-boggling to think about it. Something that you said you were going to do. Yeah, if you said you were going to kill anybody, you'd bury him in the fire pit. I mean, it seems kind of convenient. I never told anybody. You never told anybody that, Dave. We're not stupid, dude. You think we're going to make that up? I'm not making anything up. You think I made this up? We know everything. We know the answers to the questions we ask, man. I'm trying to get you to say that you're not an evil, no good bastard and that there are some extenuating circumstances that you killed the woman you love, pretended that she was alive for over a month, 
I mean, I because if you just look at it, fires on top of her. If you just look, yeah. If you look at it, you're like, that has to be a heartless, cold bastard that wrapped this woman up like that and put her in this fire pit. So went all through life had bonfires. And tomorrow's her birthday. Tomorrow's her birthday. It might be time to let that go. Her I think everyone will feel better. Her daughter, whether they're a stranger or not. This has got to be tough. You only have one mom. Especially if you never forgave her. She never has a chance to forgive her now. It's true. Her parents. How old are her parents? I don't know. Old. They both have heart problems. Nothing. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so so we get a lot of monologuing here, but not from the villain. So that's out of context with the usual place where we get a lot of monologuing. Uh Again, the, the two interrogators talking more than anybody else that I can see. What I love is the kind of brown shirt literally does a flex during during this, which is just like, that is out of nowhere. More barnstorming Brad Pitt performance uh, from him. What I would love in there, I'm off in my own imagination now, because what I would love, they are talking so much, so much during this. And maybe it's having the given effect because because I would have given up. By, I'd be like, oh, what do, what do you want to know now? Just anything to stop you guys talking and talking and talking. But I would just, I would just love to, the guy to get up and leave. I'm sure they wouldn't notice if he just got up and left. They're so into their own their own flexing world of just monologuing at the moment. But maybe I've got it wrong. Uh, Chase, what do you think? Uh, I will say this is this ended well, but it's not a great interrogation, and I'm hoping it works. And I don't know the outcome of this case at the time that I'm. Uh, kind of taking all of these notes and stuff that I'm looking at here. Uh, when he says tomorrow, the investigator and detective says tomorrow's her birthday. And then he leans back and this arm cross is very indicative of something serious in an interview. And we talk about people who teach absolutes all the time. We're seeing the, sus the suspect lean back and do this hard arm cross. Uh, I just want to break this down for you so that you're aware of how it fits in with the SBA, the Standards for Behavioral Analysis. Let's break it down. One, it's a change. And then we get cluster after that. The lean back occurs with eye contact avoidance, arm crossing, joint protection, digital protection, like fingers being tucked in, and an increase into chest breathing instead of abdominal breathing, which is a stress. All of that is stress. And we have context. Is there context here? So the behavior occurs within a context that might need to identify a response to. And then we have checklist. We're seeing behaviors that are typical in the very common uh, accepted list of things that might indicate stress or deception. And if you don't have a copy of the SBA, then find it all over the place. That's all I got there. Scott, what do you got? All right. I think his body language is just about as closed off as you can get. This guy's like almost balling up in front of him. And he's decided to try to decide on what his next move is going to be. Because he doesn't know what to do, he's the, getting boxed in. He's getting closer to the corner now. They've got him, they've got him tied in there. So um, there's really no move he can make. I think he's pretty much done at this point. And they're, you know, he calms down a little bit, and they're trying to let everything kind of set and simmer in his brain, and and his mind. You know, it's like the whole. There, it's 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 dawned on him he's in trouble, and they know all this stuff. But it's just getting worse and worse and worse as they uh, as they move along, you know, for him psychologically. So I think he's feeling a lot of, of psychological uh, stress and pain in there. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Uh, I've, I've been. Dang it, I'm there. missing everybody. I'm so busy goofing around. Uh, Greg, what do you got? <laughs> Yeah, so he starts off, I agree with you, Chase, all those signs of stress, all that barriering. Let's talk about pre-confession body language for a minute. We know what happens with people. They get into an emotional state. They drop down to their right, looking with their eyes. They go back over and do internal voice. They're thinking about what the implications are. They go back to the right. What that doesn't mean is they're feeling emotion or remorse. Most often people mistake that. They think, well, they're feeling remorse for what they've done. No, often they might feel like, well, it's up. I'm done. There's nothing else for me to do. And, you know, you see it in psychopaths even where they may not have any emotional connection with other people. 
but they're certainly worried about self. And it is hopelessness and futility. That's what you're selling is anxiety and hopelessness and futility. And when you get them to that point, you don't let them go. And they do a pretty good, this is again, whether they're taught or whether it's just they're stumbling through like blind dogs in a meat house, different story, but they get a pretty good application of stress. Let's look at what they do. We see it starting to work. And then they start poking with on him a little bit longer. The good cop throws out another thing. The guy who's playing good cop on the left throws out another opportunity. Maybe it was a heart attack. The reason that can't work and it is a stress inducer is because this guy can't say, yeah, it was a heart attack because he beat her with an axe handle and strangled her with a rope. Well, you can't say, oh, yeah, it was. And, and I did that to make it look better. No. So he knows that this pushed him in the hole a little bit further with that. That, that no lifeline's going to work. He can't take it out. And so there's more. He, he tries to maintain this facade. At one point, this guy even puts his own handcuffs back on you guys' whole point of compliance and trying to be a good prisoner. The good, tra- tra- the good cop tries one more time and says, maybe she attacked you. He still doesn't fall for that. Then we watch his language soften and get very slow and quiet. And he starts to adapt and play with his body. And you can tell he's starting to be internally focused. That's the beginning of the end. And Mark, that's the futility that you're talking about. Then this, the comic relief is the other guy doing his mantra of your heartless bastard, your heartless bastard, your heartless bastard. And that's repetition. And I've actually seen people, there's actually in the British, in the British uh, interrogation technique, there's one called um, monotonous. And that's exactly what they do. Yeah. It's actually a British interrogation technique. Yeah. But the fire pit comment, when he goes back to that fire pit comment, now we see him going to sacred space and start to massage his scalp for relief as the cops play their hands with the last fact they really have. Even this good cop is now starting to poke him, poke him, poke him when he's saying, you wrapped her up in the fire pit. Ultimately, all approaches that are done well, whether whatever it takes to get you there, all approaches that are done well lead to futility, and we see futility in this guy. Now it's time to close. When you pretend to keep up the charade, if, some, if someone's still alive by using her phone and you get rid Today's of Today's the day to tell your true story. It is the day to tell the true story. And whether you're a heartless bastard who needs put away for every day of the rest of their lives, or if it's something that's spun out of control, and then you're like, well, I can't call the police. What do I say? What do I do? I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. But I know that I, the person I love more than anything in the world is gone. So, you know. You're used to having two incomes and you can't live with one income and maybe it was a heart attack and you had to do something and you're just, and people, the guy with Barbara just did that and had his mom. Sure. I just got, I just so a year or so ago. I mean, we've struggled with less, way less than that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so, so it's not the money thing. I have nothing else to say. I told her that, I Well, you didn't tell us everything, you know. No, you didn't tell us how and why you killed her. Again, was it an argument? It was the heat of the moment, passion, and then you're like, well, what do I do? Or you're a heartless bastard. You killed the woman you claimed she loved more than you. anything you're in the world. You defend yourself. Right. And you, you said she's schizophrenic. You said you never put your hands on her before. Did she ever put her hands on you? No. She has her daughter. She has her grandson. She has her. Tomorrow daughter. is her birthday. Tomorrow is her birthday for them to sit there and reflect. Yes. On the things that they had to see, the things they had to do. That you just. The agony they've been going through for the last month. Heartlessly killed the woman you love more than anything in the world. It's 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 mind-boggling to think about it. Something that you said you were going to do. Yeah, and if you said you were going to kill anybody, you'd bury him in the fire pit. I mean, it seems kind of convenient. I never told anybody. You never told anybody that, Dave. We're not stupid, dude. You think we're going to make that up? I'm not making anything up. You think I made this up? We know everything. We know the answers to questions we ask, man. I'm trying to get you to say that you're not an evil, no good bastard, and that there's some extenuating circumstances that you killed the woman you love, pretended that she was alive for over a month, 
I mean, I because if you just look at it, fires on top of her. If you just look, yeah. If you look at it, you're like, that has to be a heartless, cold bastard that wrapped this woman up like that and put her in this fire pit. So, went all over through life, had bonfires. And tomorrow's her birthday. Tomorrow's her birthday. It might be time to let that go. Her I think everyone will feel better. Her daughter, whether they're estranged or not. This has got to be tough. You only have one mom. Especially if you never forgave her. She never has a chance to forgive her now. It's true. Her parents. How old are her parents? I don't know. So old. They both have heart problems. Nothing. How old are you, David? 52. Got a lot of years left. Yeah, I doubt that. How old was your mom? 87. 87? How old did your how old was your dad? 62. How we doing in here? You got a um, picture. A picture of? Something that you can print out. Of today? Mm -hmm. Sure. Email it to us. Can we go maybe and have a print? Yeah, I got it right now. Yeah. I'll do that right now. <sighs> that was the uh, thing that Bowen was working on. I took it upstairs. That's why I did it. All right. Hey, Aaron. Okay. Oh, I could show it to him. No, he said all right. Do you want to see a picture, Dave? No, I don't need to see a picture. You know what you did. All right. Go ahead, Dave. You, you want me to go ahead? I need a cigarette. I, uh, so tell us what you're going to tell us so you can have a cigarette. I'll give you a cigarette. Yeah, I need a cigarette. Okay, well, you're going to tell us what you tell us, then I'll give you a cigarette. I'll give you two. But we're... we're we'll, we'll stay downstairs. I'll let you... Go ahead, get it off your chest, Dave. You'll feel better. I swear to God. I ain't trying to be funny. I don't even why I snap these back on, but he's unloosened back off again. Okay, so what do you want, so, Dave? Explain just, it to me. Just uh, take these loosened off again. Okay. So, You're not going to take a swing at us, are you? No. It's not your fault. No. Okay. No. I don't think it's anybody's fault necessarily. All right, Greg, what do you got? So now he's been letting this guy simmer. The guy's sitting there boiling for a little bit, and he comes up. And I think the the guy who's in the room knows this guy's ready to break. And he knows he needs one little piece of information, and so he's going to have him bring back the photo. And that's all this entire thing is. He's ready for him to go. I don't think the guy who went out has any clue that he's that far. I think this guy is able to tell that he's getting ready to go under. So he tells him, go get a picture. And then the best part of the whole thing, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one, is because this is a great break. This is a clear break. When he says, all right, that's it. That's the end of the interrogation. From here, it's collect information is all you're going to do. And that's exactly, when you're doing an intel interrogation, often that's exactly how it works. They resist telling you, Chase, we all were taught, if you get captured, you got to withhold information. There's only so much you can do to withhold information. And very different depending on which country. And some countries say, I can't answer that, I can't answer that, I can't answer that. We don't take that approach. And so you got to be able to say something to the guy. And when you get to the point where the guy stops trying to resist interrogation and just goes, I'm done, it's just like that often. It's just, all right, whatever it takes, I'm done. However they got here, this is the break point in the entire interrogation. Seen it many times in real life. And you can't ever tell what a given person is going to do, but it's always recognizable when it comes out. Sometimes they break down crying. Sometimes they scream and yell. Sometimes they do other things because they've realized that they've reached a point of futility and that's it. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so it's become even more absurd for me right now. Uh, it's actually become one of the classics of absurdism, waiting for Godot. It's gone from 12 monkeys to nothing happening. And, and yeah, you're right. Greg, there is a subtle move in here, but what I love most about this waiting for Godot moment is let's go and he does not leave. He goes to the door, he opens it, and he doesn't go anywhere. Why? Because I believe he doesn't know what's happening. 
He has no real idea about what's going on. Given his level of acting in the rest of it, how he would be able to produce such a fine moment of actually not knowing what the hell is going on at this point, how, if that isn't a true moment of, I don't actually know what's going on right now, if that's not a true moment of that, I've never seen anybody be able to go from such bad acting to absolute perfection like that. And why would he do that on purpose at that point? Because nobody's even looking at him at that point. Why would he go, you know what, I'm going to produce the most perfect bit of of performance for nobody right now. Why? Because I'm so good as an actor. I'm going to do it for art at this point. No, he has no idea what's going on. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? For art. <laughs> for art. So there's an interrogation manual that you cannot get online or anywhere that the Department of Defense developed and made into a little pocket-sized spiral book. Maybe, Greg, you had one of these. I don't know if they made them. Uh, it's for interrogators. And inside this book, there are 34 things they list, which they call the ideal characteristics of an interrogator. And what I'm going to do for you right now, I'm going to read from this book to you. I'm going to give you the first nine of them, and I'll let you tell me if you see any of these qualities uh, or behaviors in the interrogators here. So you're going, to, you're going to read a book, and it's probably going to be less tedious than the last video that we is, just watched. Is it thirty? Or is it an <laughs> FM? You're, is it an FM you're working on, Chase? No, 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 no. Uh, all right. So first, prepares for the interview. Develops themes and ideas to assist them with obtaining information in a way that allows the subject to feel trusting, save face, feel better, project blame, and increases the anxiety associated with continued deception. Builds rapport. Rationalizes and minimizes the criminal act. Uses optional questions. Confronts the suspects. Recognizes nonverbal cues. Treats suspects with respect. And finally, shows a professional image. So interesting here. And I thought was weird to me. He's 52 and he says his dad is 62? Died at 62. He I said he died at 62. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, man. <laughs> okay. So watching his behavior, he went from pre-confession to apprehension. He was ready to go. Then, so pre-confession, all that behavior was there. His, now his head starts moving rapidly in adjustments to sounds and movement to adjust to what's going on. His arms are stiff and rigid. He's now protecting his wrists. He's shifting around in his chair. And finally, we have this reduced ventral orientation. And this essentially means that somebody is fearful. It shows... Uh, when they only use their head to identify threats beside them instead of moving their shoulders or adjusting their their body to point to something. So their body's pointing in the same direction. There's rocking back and forth, and his resistance is ramped right back up. If this guy confesses, these cops have just become the luckiest people in the world. But let's quickly talk about weapons retention for just one second. Number one, no weapons should be in an interview room in almost every situation. There are very few exceptions to that. Number two, when you uncuff somebody, and I've done this a gazillion times, from one of these things that's around their waist, we call them a cummerbund uh, in, in my line of work, in my old line of work, you need to have your weapon away from that person as much as possible. you got to adjust your center of balance with your weapon side leg back and away from the suspects. There are lots of reasons for this that I won't go into. But number three, you uncuff the farthest limb from yourself first. And for this, they may have different protocols. Maybe the department has something weird, but that is the safest way. In an ideal situation, you'd be doing this from behind them while they are seated. But now his arm is open his gun is eight inches from this guy's hand, and he's reaching across. And if you want to tell me they've had training and interrogation and don't even know how to uncuff a person in an interrogation room, 
please have at it, Greg. They, did, they did ask him earlier on if he was going to be nice. So <laughs> I mean, there was so, and he and he did say, yeah. Well, he said like, it was going to be. They nice. said you're not going to. No, we're 100. You're not going to swing at us, and he said, no, no, no. So you know, they checked it out, and it was all good, mate. We're 100 percent agreement. No weapons ever <laughs> anywhere mm. near. And I'm not even talking about firearms. I'm talking about weapons of any kind. Nothing loose they can get their hands on. None of that kind of stuff. Better not, uh, Scott, Greg, Greg, Greg. Okay, Scott, I already gone. I'll oh, try to go. I went first. All right. Um, all right. Well, I, keep in mind when the detective does leave, he's not going anywhere. He's next door watching this on a monitor. A hundred bucks says that's what a thousand bucks says that's what he's doing. And he's letting this guy sit in there with the other detective as he's talking about his mortality. He's talking about his family, bringing all these things in. To, to add his weights to that psychological stress he's already got going on. So, and and I think he knows what he's doing. He's being a, he's being a dink, D-I-N-K, uh, on his way out, the way he's acting. He's just trying to get on this guy's nerves, and he's getting on all of our nerves because he's executing it, I think, brilliantly. I think he's doing it well. I know what it's like to, to, to watch somebody do that. I've seen it so many times where somebody's just trying to be that way, to be that way on purpose, and he's doing it. And I, I think what I think what's missing in some of this is the is the experience of having seen this over and over or see situations like this a lot. I think that might be the the rub we're having here. It's because we're seeing different things than than the upstairs is seeing different things <clears throat> than the downstairs is because the our approaches are different or uh, approaches in sharpening is different than the way I see it as an approach. You're so right. I've never seen human <laughs> beings do anything in real life. No, I, I, I don't think. I, I think you have a different opinion based on whatever your opinion is. Is only thing it is. Yeah. I don't yeah. think it's. I don't think it's experience. I think it's just a difference of opinion. And uh, I, I don't. I don't know if these guys are good or bad, but they did a good job closing this guy. They, they closed in the job. right I, spots at the right time. Yeah, I can't believe that's luck. I, I can't I can't believe the way this was executed that it's all luck. But I think well, if what they did is pure instinct, it's not stupid. If what it they wasn't, did is pure I'm not instinct. saying I'm not saying it was, I'm saying what he did uncuffing was definitely. Oh yeah, that look, we're not we're not disagreeing about the dangerous I always tell you the story about a guy in an interrogation room getting thrown out by the source, getting beaten up. And I remember saying, "So what happened, chief?" and he said, I went and I grabbed this guy and I put my hands on him. The next thing I know, he turned into Bruce Lee and he was flying mm. through the room and doing all kinds of stuff. You don't know who you're dealing with when you capture somebody. You don't know who you're dealing with when you arrest somebody. This guy's got a drug history. Who knows what he does? Maybe he's got nothing to lose. So so you think they're just uncuffing him like that and other times they'd uncuff people differently? No, no. no I'm so just saying bad at I, uncuffing. I so if they're bad at uncuffing, is there the possibility that also – Bad at interrogating. That's an irrational yeah. question, but yes, yeah. there's of course there's it's always you're irrational. You're not going to do anything. Your face <laughs> is irrational. <laughs> but, but there's, it doesn't matter if they're bad at one thing. It doesn't mean they're also bad at the other. I'm no, saying, it of course, they can be bad at it all. It doesn't. But but given that both things need training, yeah. and they and and so they've either ignored or An haven't assumption. been trained on one thing, which is not uncommon. They've ignored or not been trained yeah. on something else. I mean, it's not possible. uncommon. As you say, it's possible. not uncommon. Yeah. And we started this thing off by saying they may or may not have any training. The whole point. Sure. But well, there are possible. certainly, anytime I see a person in the interrogation room with a gun, I'm not comfortable with that, for sure. But, Chase, you hit it dead on the head. Every department has different protocols. I don't know what theirs is, but if it's that, it should be changed. I would take it out. I hope so. I mean, it, it and that has nothing like, to do. That, to that has little to do with interrogation, Mark. That has nothing to do with interrogation. No, no. For example, I'm saying, in my I'm world, saying equally so. They they uncuffed somebody badly, and they still didn't get shot. So we could go. Well, they got the result that they wanted, which was not to get yeah, shot. This is yeah. That's there, there's no reason to go down that road. You know, with this, we're we're talking about Just different opinion. Thing. Different opinion. Yeah, I he's know. doing. Oh, well, we got to find us. What I think Mark might be saying is that. A lack of training and success can also be a lack of training and success. What well, could be survivor bias and you do? All are still saying the same thing, though. Mm. I think we're all saying the same thing. There I may not agree. be any training whatsoever. There was a success. Still they, do, still, they do well. There's no. I said right at the start, they get a great result. 
The what only I, thing what I'm, I'm worried about I'm is that they're getting—they're not getting it via their own volition completely. Don't know. That's it. Don't know. Yeah, that's what I said. That's what I'm worried about. That's what I'm. Concerned. The only thing that I would disagree with is the source of the success. Where did the success come from? Well, I think it's combination. It always is a combination. You know, you can have a thousand well, it's interrogations. It's a ratio combination. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But you can have a thousand interrogations. And like I can tell you some of the best interrogators I've ever known, you could send to a certain source. Boom, flat, no break, nothing. And then you can find somebody who is just the worst interrogator you've ever known, who's disheveled, who has their shit just all in a pile. And they go in. And they get something out of them because of the chemistry and the way it works out. That's part of what police departments often don't have the luxury of. We do, Chase, from our world where we had these massive numbers of interrogators. We could role it. play. We could set it up and say, this guy's going to do well with this one. I, I would not have picked a better outcome than this one. I mean, this is quick. For sure. For this sure. For sure. So and I, yes, like I guess, guy, I guess our guy, concern they, is that they, they don't have choice. There is no, this is what they do all the time. There's nobody else to pick. And whoever goes in that room will always get that performance. That's the, that's the Maybe. concern. We don't know. We don't know. Is exactly no, no, we right. don't know. But it's right. still a concern. Agreed. We don't know whether whether they are always doing the same thing or they're sharpening yeah, yeah. and shifting gears. Yeah, we don't know. We agree. All right, shut up and let's go to the next one. <laughs> that's it, I think. Well, well, hey, don't no, no, we've got another one. We've got another one to go. Yeah. Are we not doing it? We're doing it. Don't care. 11. Yeah, we're doing it. Let me see where to put my notes. Is that all y'all got? Is that it? Uh, I got one more, actually. I pulled out all my stops already. All I got is, is Bucky stickers. I was going to do this on the next one. Oh, man, I got everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I got every kitchen utensil you can think of. So far, I've used my... Albert, well, my dog Albert, his thing. You could have bring Albert up uh, <laughs> next to him. Yeah. I got my and usual then, Illuminati uh, signals. This is from. Uh, I got nothing. Dang, this light thing. This automatic light thing. I don't like it. This is what from is uh, Hilton Head, North Carolina. It's a it's a piece of wood with little shells on it that I found on the beach once. Years Here's ago. An interesting I've always one kept it for some reason. This is a weird little thing. Let me see if I can get light behind it. You might enjoy let's it. Pull, let's each pull up some weird shit during the next one. Let me show you this one. Early merch. <laughs> Early merch. <laughs> is that still Look on there? This. No. Oh okay. no. I don't it think you can see it if I do that. What is it? Mini it's disc. Three dimension. Oh. Yeah, it's a weird little thing. Oh. It's like it's like uh, 3D printed or something. Yeah, and it's that's my cool. brother-in-law's in that business that's and very he cool. printed this of us and sent it over. How are you, David? 52. Got a lot of years left. Yeah, I doubt that. How old was your mom? 87. 87? How old did your how old was your dad? 62. Duh. How are we doing in here? We got a um, picture. A picture of? Something they can print out. Of today? Mm hmm Sure. Email it to us. Maybe we'll maybe have a print. Yeah, I got it right now. Yeah. I'll do that right now. That was the uh, thing that Bowen was working on. I took it upstairs. That's why I did it. All right. Hey, Aaron. Hey. Oh, I could show it to him. No, he said all right. Do you want to see a picture, Dave? No, I don't need to see a picture. You know what you did. All right. Go ahead, Dave. You want me to go ahead? I need a cigarette. Tell us what you're going to tell us so you can have a cigarette. I'll give you a cigarette. Yeah, I need a cigarette. Okay, well, you're going to tell us what you're going to tell us, then I'll give you a cigarette. I'll give you two. But we're, we're we'll, we'll stay downstairs. I'll let you. Go ahead, get it off the chest, Dave. You'll feel better. I swear to God. I ain't trying to be funny. I don't even know why I snap these back on, but he's unloosing back off again. 
Okay, so what do you want, so Dave? Explain just, it to me. Just uh, take these instruments off again. Okay. So, You're not going to take a swing at us, are you? No. It's not your fault. Okay. No. I don't think it's anybody's fault necessarily. Things go awry in life. If it wasn't so early during the daytime, I'd let you fall right now. But we can't do that in the building with. We have to take you downstairs with the bosses. The bosses. Man, we smoke in the building. You, know, so so you tell. You tell us what's going on. You tell us what's going on, Dave. So we know you're not a heartless bastard. And I promise you can smoke all you want. All right. Well, not, all not all you want. Not all you want. But well, we <laughs> got the reasonable efforts. <laughs> Get it off your chest, Dave. You feel better. You got to feel a little bit better already, just knowing that you're going to make that decision. I didn't mean to fucking do it. I didn't. I didn't mean for it to end up like that. No, it's not a very. I didn't. I'm not a propitious person like that. It's not a very respectful way for a person to end up. I know it's not. I got fucking scared, man. I'm really scared. Just. Oh, God, man. I understand being scared, no <laughs> doubt about that. So what was it, David? An argument or something or what? An argument. She called the police on me again for no reason. I mean, really no reason at all. I just, I just snapped, man. Snap. <laughs> what was the argument over? Because uh, we uh, had argued the day before, and I, I had left just to try and keep the peace. She just kept accusing me of cheating on her and cheating on her, and I wasn't doing it. And then she just... The day before, and then the day she called the cops on you? Yeah. Tell us about that. I, I don't even know what the argument was even about. I don't know what it was about. Right. Well, I didn't mean to do this or I did man. I love her. Love Robin. <laughs> I believe that. 16 years is a long time. Why did you just... All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, kitchen towel. Kitchen towel for uh, tissue paper there. It is, in my mind, a, a rough around the edges interview here. And it is about as rough as that, that kitchen towel would be, uh, wiping the tears from your eyes. Um, but look... You know, they get there in the end, or certainly they've got him sobbing. I don't know whether he's sobbing because he's about to confess or, or he wants the, to get the hell out of there uh, because it's it's so annoying being in this in this situation. Uh, again, I would just say, look, you know, good job. He's compliant uh, with that, with the with the ruse that they uh, that they have there. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, whether they got lucky or they got him to talk through process, whatever they stumbled on worked and he cries. This crying, I'm not sure it's, I agree with you, Mark. I don't think it's about her because one thing he never says is I didn't mean to kill her. No, it never says that one time. He says everything else. Hey, it happened. I killed her. Boom, boom, boom. I'm not a horrible person. Never says didn't mean to kill her. Got in a fight. They've given him that information. This sounds a lot like premeditated. I'm surprised he didn't get a lot more punishment. The crying's probably real. It's just not about the right thing. But they are rewarding co compliance and he is a compliant guy by saying, we'll give you a couple of cigarettes. Incentive always works. Incentive, by the way, with prisoners of war is the number one way to get them to talk. You give them something they ask for, they feel like it gives them some kind of power back in their life, and it usually works. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, this guy is dying to confess. He starts confessing, and the cop is hustling around the room checking his phone while his gun is two feet from this guy's hand and then starts belittling him in the middle of his attempted confession. The detective on the left seems to be doing a lot better at this. He's probably doing it uh, maybe unconsciously. Maybe he's had some training, but he's been mirroring the suspect, the guy on the left, almost since the first video that we looked at, if you've been watching for that. And he seems to have about 20 times the amount of self-control and composure that the other detective has here. Uh, no judgment on him. It might be a, a, a just a departmental lack of training or, or even funds for training. So, uh, Scott, what do you got? Uh, yeah, I agree with you about the gun stuff. That bugs me. I can't. I can't get past that at all. But I think him. I think he's. What we're seeing is the difference in the good cop and the bad cop. You have these the the big personality to the calm guy. This guy has to 
has to be out of control. He has to act like he, he's loud and being a dink. So that's how he gets on the guy's nerves. But I agree with you. Half once the guy starts talking, shut up. You know, zip it. Let him do it, man. Let him tell you what happened. So that that actually that actually bothered me there. But otherwise, you know, I think things are just going the way they've been going. Things go awry in life. If it wasn't so early during the daytime, I'd let you smoke right now. But we can't do that in the building with... We have to take you downstairs. With the bosses. The bosses. Man, we smoke in the building. You, you, tell, you tell us what's going on. You tell us what's going on, Dave, so we know you're not a heartless bastard, and I promise you can smoke all you want, all right? Not, not, all, not all you want. Not all you want, but... Well... We are talking with the Get it off your oh, chest, Dave. You feel better. Man. You got to feel a little bit better already, just knowing that you're going to make that decision. I didn't mean to fucking do it. I didn't. I didn't mean for it to end up like that. No, it's not a very... I didn't. I'm not a propitious person like that. It's not a very respectful way for a person I, I, to end up. I know it's not. I got fucking scared, man. I'm really scared. Right. Just... Oh, God, man. I understand being scared. No doubt about that. So what was it, David? Are you just something or what? Or I mean, she called the police on me again for no reason. I mean, really, no reason at all. I just, I just snap, man. Snap. What was the argument over? Uh, because we you know, had argued the day before, and I, I had left just to try and keep the peace. She just kept accusing me of cheating on her, cheating on her, and I wasn't doing it. So she just the day before and then the day she called the cops on you yeah tell us about that I, I don't even know what the argument was even about I don't, I don't even know what it was about alright well, I didn't mean to can do this or I did man I love her love Robin I believe that 16 years is a long time why did you just have to say all right, so far we've taken a look at this interrogation. We've all got our own opinions about it. Of course, the upstairs is different than the downstairs. But uh, we've broken down the body language and the approaches. And what did you see, Mark? Tell us about it. Well, here, here in the servants' quarters downstairs, <laughs> uh, what, 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 what you were seeing, <laughs> where, the, where the light is brighter and the view is much better. Um, look, there's no doubt that they got the results that they were were looking for. And so absolute credit for that. Uh, still, at the end of the day, it does seem a little bit like a couple of Muppets uh, to me. Um, you, you, one of them a little, a little less Muppet than the other. There is the 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 idea or the argument that that the complete Muppet, in my view, is like that's a purposeful thing. I can't see that. Uh, I can't, it doesn't it doesn't gel for me in terms of what is him acting and what is him uh, being himself. I don't see people who can do those two things at the same time. And as everybody says, I've seen a lot of that in my time. And I've got a lot of experience around that. Um, so I, I feel a little unsatisfied by that particular um, interrogation in some ways. But in the end, look, it's a satisfying result. The guy cries at the end, I think, just wanting to be out of this situation. It's futile. And so to your point, Greg, you know, they have achieved that um, that approach of of futility and, and got there uh, in the end. Chase, what do you think? Here's what I want you to do if you're watching this right now. At the end of this video, you can take the little red ball at the bottom of this YouTube video, drag that thing all the way to the right or the to your left, then you can drag it to the right and watch a time lapse of a beautiful Virginia sunset right here over my shoulder. <laughs> That's all I've got. Greg, <laughs> That's great. Yeah, idea. basement view is good and better. <laughs> it is nice. Yeah, good, good move, Chase. Really nice place. Yeah, I think, Mark, I agree with you about the whole thing of whether they got there exactly by intent or not. I'll tell you, I also have the advantage of having watched the entire video, and you might want to go check out 8MC, because they come in, they look at the guy, they talk to him for a short period of time, they leave the room and orchestrate. And that is when things change and this guy starts getting loud and all of that. So I think, and Scott, to your point, goofy and annoying might be his idea of bad cop. My idea of bad cop is more yeah, that's, menacing. That's what I think. But his yeah. could be different. But they collectively deliver the information and close what he needs 
to break. Now, is it easier break than somebody else who says, I need an attorney? Absolutely. But for my tip, for my taste, from a Sharfian non-read point of view, they do a good job of orchestrating fear up, fear down. We know all futility to get him across the line to the very end. Now, whether you like their style or not, different story entirely. Lots of styles in interrogation. I'd love to see, guys, if you're watching us, love to see what your what your close rate, how you've done, what your success or, or fail rate has looked like. And that would be interesting if you're there. Either write us, put something in the comments, tell us we're full of it. Whatever. I think mm. it'd be good to hear what you've done or and other, what kind of department. Other interviews, other 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 film of yeah. them. Yeah. We'd love Fantastic. to see more of you. Yeah, and see how you do this. Cause I yeah. I know that Sharfian things can be very wonky compared to what you guys are used to with Reed. And they can almost feel out of place because of how they come together. And I think there's some good stuff going here. Scott, what do you got? Well, I th I think this is like if we if we compared the two, like when NASCAR first started or, or car racing, not even NASCAR, a long time ago, I saw those little jalopies coming down the you know, running the circle, and they're all bumping into each other and hitting the wall and they just bounce off and keep driving. It's all wobbly, but they're going to they, but their goal is to win the race and get to the to the flag. Now you go to these, you know, Indy One and NASCAR, they're doing the same thing, except they're not bumping into stuff. They're just zipping around the track. So I think, and they reach the same goal, whoever the winner is. So I think that's what we're looking at. We're looking at something, just a, a jalopy going down the road, trying to keep control as it bangs into stuff and goes along as it makes its way to the goal, because it knows what the goal is. It's got an idea of what some of the, the, the things it's supposed to do are, or the driver does in the car. And and that's what they're doing, trying to keep it in the road and trying to keep everything the way it should be. So I think maybe that's why things seem a little bit um, out of control at some point, which I don't think it was out of control. I don't see anything out of control in there. But that, that's why it may seem that way, because they're trying to get everything straight and headed for, headed for the goal line or finish line, whatever they call it, in, in racing. So I think that's the big the big difference here. And I, I definitely, if I had to vote in the comments, I would definitely vote the upstairs one or the downstairs. <laughs> but I'm just throwing it out there. That's what I, that's I, that's what I would do if I was going to vote or leave a comment. People always want us to disagree. You got one. There it is. For the record, uh, none of us are casting judgment. These guys are probably wonderful cops. They're good yeah. people. They they want the best for society. They want to help society. They're not trying to do stuff. There's no malice behind anything that we observe today. And we're not ascribing malice to anything that's going on. Mm -mm. No, I'm sure these guys are awesome. So, all right, fellas, this is another good one. And we'll too, that's too late. They sent somebody around to beat us up already. They're I'm saying, ready. They didn't, they didn't wait, they didn't wait till the end. They're just like, go and, like, go and get those guys. Yeah, yeah, all right, we'll do it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we'll take it on the other. Yeah, yeah. Listen, All right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go <laughs> and, and just answer the door. I'm not here. <laughs> I'm where Mark lives. Just tell them where Mark lives. They'll go to Canada. They don't care. Take care of it for me, would you? Thanks, Hot Rod. There. And Greg is too cool for school. That's yeah. it, everybody. Yeah. Just don't have any tools. Nothing sitting. <laughs> <laughs> right, hold on. Let's Greg. see. I got something close by. I'll get my best shot. Here. How's this? <laughs> yeah, I don't. No, I don't want. I don't want to see that. <laughs> Put it on. Put it yeah. on. So if you have to slap somebody, this is what you're going to slap them with. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Talk yeah, to them. I mean, look, we'll be we'll be seeing that in the Puff Daddy case. Clearly, I'm okay. sure. Yeah, I'm that'll, sure. That'll that particular implement will come up. I somewhere. use those as bookends on one of my shelves. So, right. Okay. That's that's what he says as well. Okay, everybody, get ready with their little sign off thing. You ready? Okay. One, two, three. So what do you got? <laughs>